Hi guys, Dane here, joined by a very meowy biggie. You might hear him off camera, he's just over there. And today we're doing the latest version of My Cat Picks My TBR. So I've already filmed the footage of Biggie picking the books, so I'm going to cut to that now, and then I'm going to talk about each of the books individually. Alright, where's this cat of mine? I saw you a second ago, there you are. Hello. Hello. So let's start with Bill Bryson, Biggie. Bill Bryson, we got At Home, Down Under, or Made in America. What, do you th what are you thinking so far, Biggs? Pick one of these. Pick one. Oh. You picked down under, did you, Biggie? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I know. Okay. So next up... So we have down under. So next up we have... These are all Peter James. We have Twilight, Possession and Sweetheart. Go on then. Choose one. Choose one. Oh, sweetheart he picked there. And then our final two, three remaining choices, this is the Isaac Asimov edition. We have the Caves of Steel, the Martian Way, and the Robots of Dawn. You gone for that one, you gone for the Caves of Steel. Even though you dropped it underneath, but there we go. You have these two bonus ones. You're gonna let the internet hear you purr. Good boy, very sloppy. Okay. So, as you can tell, he picked The Caves of Steel by Isaac Asimov, which is a classic robot novel. We, he picked Sweetheart by Peter James, which I believe is a standalone thriller, and then Down Under by Bill Bryson, which is travel writing about Bryson's time travelling around Australia. So I'm going to go and head off and read these, and then I'll report back and let you know what I think. Okay, so I've read two of the books that Biggie picked out for me. So the first one I read was Sweetheart by Peter James. I'm going to read you the blurb here. Charlie has a strange feeling when she sees the idyllic mill house with its cluster of outbuildings, the lake and the swirling mill stream. A powerful sense of recognition, as if she has been there before. Except she knows she hasn't. After Charlie and her husband Tom move into Elmwood Mill, sinister memories of a previous existence start to haunt her. Despite both their attempts to dismiss everything with rational explanations, the feeling turns to certainty as the memories become increasingly vivid and terrifying. Charlie is persuaded to undergo hypnosis. But in searching deep into her past, she unwittingly opens a Pandora's box of evil. And now the terror is free. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I am actually going to do a full review of this, which I'll link to you below if it's out. But basically, this is kind of reminiscent of uh, the, ha the House on Cold Hill, which is a more recent Peter James novel in that they're both kind of haunted house stories. This one also deals with like hypnotism and past regression. It's not amazingly written and there are lots of cliches throughout, especially like haunted house cliches. But it is still what it is, you know, it's pretty good for that. And I mean, it was published, I think, in like 1990. So, you know, that, that's almost 30 years ago. And James has got better and better as a writer since then. So for me, it was almost of interest because of that fact, because it's one of his earlier books. It's also one that would be a good one to read if you're a horror fan, because it kind of breaks from his police procedural stuff. And it does kind of follow this sort of family drama as well. You know, the usual stuff you get in a haunted house story where the family moves into the haunted house and then like only one of the two adults in the relationship or whatever believe it's haunted. And it, like, as I say, it has a lot of those cliches, but I enjoyed it for what it was. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. And then I read The Caves of Steel, which is a classic robot novel by Isaac Asimov. So this is another one that I'm going to do a full review of. Uh, I'll read you the blurb here. Detective Elijah Bailey investigates the murder of an offworlder in Spacetown. In the opinion of the Spacers, the murder is tied up with recent attempts to sabotage the Spacer-sponsored project of converting Earth to an integrated human-robot society on the model of the Outer Worlds. To search for the killer in the city's vast caves of steel, Elijah is assigned a Spacer partner named R. Daniil. That's Robot Daniil. And notwithstanding the celebrated three laws of robotics which should make such a murder impossible, R. Daniil is soon Elijah's prime suspect. This is the first of Isaac Asimov's robot novels. So this is kind of like a sci-fi detective novel, or almost like a police procedural. Uh, but we have also the story is investigating the three laws of robotics and how far they can be pushed. I didn't see the solution to this murder coming, although I think towards the end I started to flag and so I wasn't necessarily trying to actively guess who done it, I was just reading to see who done it? <laughs> so this isn't anywhere near as good as I Robot, like the classic short story collection, but it was still interesting to read, especially because of its like historical significance within the science fiction genre. I gave this like a 3.5 out of 5. I think I might have enjoyed it more if it didn't have this super tiny print, which actually made it quite difficult to read, especially in like low light conditions. But um, 
you know, I don't want to hold that against it or anything. And yeah, it was worth reading if you're an Asimov fan. I just don't think it would be the, the best place to start with him. But I am glad Biggie picked this out because I think this has been on my own TBR since 2015. So yay, I finally ticked it off. Okay, do I have a story for you? So this is number three the, of the books that Biggie picked for me. It's been so long, this video in the making. It took me a while to even get to this book. Then when I finally did, I got about 150 pages in. And then after one random night out at the Art Centre open mic, I couldn't find it. I eventually found it two weeks later underneath the cushion of my sofa. Bit too late because I've already ordered a new copy, but hey-ho. So yeah, I'm going to go through and give you some of my highlights. But first off, I'm going to read you the blurb here. So this is Down Under by Bill Bryson. It is the driest, flattest, hottest, most desiccated and climatically aggressive of all the inhabited continents and still Australia teams with life, a large, proportion of, a large portion of it quite deadly. In fact, Australia has more things that can kill you in a very nasty way than anywhere else. Ignoring such dangers, and yet curiously obsessed by them, Bill Bryson journeyed to Australia and promptly fell in love with the country. And who can blame him? The people are cheerful, extrovert, quick-witted and unfailingly obliging. Their cities are safe and clean and nearly always built on water. The food is excellent, the beer is cold and the sun nearly always shines. Life doesn't get much better than this. So yeah, as you can kind of tell from that, it's travel writing about Bryson's time in Australia. This was published in, yeah, 2000. That's about right. I thought it was about the turn of the century. So obviously Australia has changed a little bit since then, but also a lot of the stuff he talks about is like the history of the country, which is kind of fascinating. So, for example, here, everyone kind of knows that Australia started out as a, I guess, a prison place. I think I think it said it's like the only country in the world that started out as a prison, basically. Uh, generally, the term of transportation was seven years, but since there was no provision for their return and few could hope to raise the fare, passage to Australia was effectively a life sentence. But then this was an unforgiving age. By the late 18th century, Britain's statute books were plump with capital offences. You could be hanged for any of 200 acts, including, notably, impersonating an Egyptian. In such circumstances, transportation was quite a merciful alternative. I like this little bit here, actually, because this relates to a Mitchell and Webb sketch as well. Uh, Among the many small and interesting mysteries of Australia in its early days is where so many of its names come from. It was Cook who called the eastern coast New South Wales, and no one now has any idea why. Did he mean to signify that this would be a new Wales of the South, or merely a new version of South Wales? If the latter, why just South Wales and not the whole of it? No one can say. What is certain is that he had no known connection to that verdant principality, southerly or otherwise. There's a bit about the Sydney Opera House here, it says, It is the Opera House that gets all the attention, and you can understand why. It's so, it's so startlingly familiar, so hey I'm in Sydney, that you can't stop looking at it. Clive James once likened the Opera House to a portable typewriter full of oyster shells, which is perhaps a tad severe. In any case, the Opera House is not about aesthetics, it's about being an icon. I like this, they talk about how where it came from, because Sydney never used to be, I guess as uh, vibrant as it, as it was today. So uh, it says, The city's capacity for mediocrity cannot be better illustrated than by the fact that where the Opera House now stands, on as fine a situation as water and land afford, was then the site of a municipal tram garage. I think this little bit's interesting here, so I'm going to read this out. The problem was the famous roof. Nothing so daringly inclined and top-heavy had ever been built before, and no one was sure that it could be. In retrospect, the haste with, the haste with which the project was begun was probably its salvation. One of the lead engineers later noted that if anyone had realised at the outset how nearly impossible a challenge it would be, it would never have received the go-ahead. Just working out the principles necessary to build the roof took five years. The whole project had been intended to last no more than six, and construction in the end dragged on for almost a decade and a half. The final cost came in at a weighty $102 million, 14 times the original estimate. Utzon, this is the guy who designed it, interestingly, has never seen his prize creation. He was effectively dismissed in 1966 after an election brought in a change of state government and has never been back. He has also never designed anything else remotely as celebrated. Goosens, the man who started it all, likewise failed to see his dream realised. In 1956, while passing through customs at Sydney Airport, he was found to be carrying a large and diversified collection of pornographic material, and he was invited to take his sordid continental habits elsewhere. Thus, by one of life's small ironies, he was unable to enjoy, as it were, his own finest erection. I thought this bit was really interesting. So this is talking about the uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge. From end to end, it stretches 1,650 feet. I mention this not just because I walked every foot of it now, but because there is a certain poignancy in the figure. In 1923, when the city burghers decided to throw a bridge across the harbour, they determined to build not just any bridge, but the longest single arch span ever constructed. It was a bold enterprise for a young country and it took longer to construct than expected, almost 10 years. Just before it was completed, in 1932, 
The Bayonne Bridge in New York quietly opened and was found to be 25 inches, 0.121%, longer. This was not a good period for Australian pride vis-a-vis -vis -vis America. Just over two weeks after the bridge opened and was found to be tragically short of superlative, Far Lap, the greatest racehorse in Australian history, died in mysterious circumstances in California. There are still Australians who say we poisoned it. Australians are hugely proud of this horse and will not thank you for pointing out that it actually was bred in New Zealand. This is terrifying. Let me read you this little story about some of the Australian wildlife. But all of these are as nothing compared with the delicate and diaphanous box jellyfish, the most poisonous creature on earth. We will hear more of the unspeakable horrors of this little bag of lethality when we get to the tropics, but let me offer here just one small story. In 1992, a young man in Cairns, ignoring all the warning signs, went swimming in the Pacific waters at a place called Holloway's Beach. He swam and dived, taunting his friends on the beach for their prudent cowardice, and then began to scream with an inhuman sound. It is said that there is no pain to compare with it. The young man staggered from the water, covered in livid whip-like stripes wherever the jellyfish's tentacles had brushed across him, and collapsed in quivering shock. Soon afterwards, emergency crews arrived, inflated him with morphine, and took him away for treatment. And here's the thing. Even unconscious and sedated, he was still screaming. I like just this little bit here, I'm not going to read a whole chunk out, but... At the far end of the main street, I came across one place so exceptional in this respect that it stopped me in my tracks. It was a shop that sold pet supplies and pornography. I'm quite genuine. I thought this was interesting, especially because I'm vegan. Yeah, you know, gotta throw that in when you can. In the morning, I treated myself to a big breakfast to fortify myself for another long day's drive. Breakfast is, of course, our most savage event in Western society. If you hesitate to agree, then I urge you to name me another occasion, any occasion at all, when you would happily devour an embryo. I mean, I wouldn't devour an embryo. But that's because I have civilised breakfasts. What are you doing, Biggie? I thought this was interesting as well because I, I know a lot of people talk on BookTube about banned books and that sort of thing, so I wanted to read this paragraph out. One thing you won't find much in Australian second-hand bookshops are 1950s or earlier editions of lots of books. The Catcher in the Rye, A Farewell to Arms, Animal Farm, Peyton Place, Another Country, Brave New World, and hundreds and hundreds of others. The reason for this is simple. They were banned. Altogether, at its peak, 5,000 titles were forbidden to be imported into the country. By the 1950s, this had fallen to a couple of hundred, but it still featured some extraordinary exclusions. Childbirth without pain, for instance, whose unflinching candour in describing where babies come from was considered a little too rich for Australian sensibilities. This was just conventional titles, by the way. The total doesn't include smutty stuff, which was of course banned outright. It wasn't just that you couldn't get certain books, you couldn't even find out which ones you couldn't get because the list of prescribed books was itself a secret. There's also the process of acclimatisation where basically a lot of people brought in animals, so for example rabbits. Somebody thought it would be a good idea to bring in some rabbits so that you could take pot shots off them off his veranda. And now there are like 28 million rabbits in Australia or something. So I'm going to read a paragraph here. Acclimatisation was one of the most foolish and dangerous ideas ever to infect the thinking of 19th century man, writes Tim Mann, in the improbably gripping feral future, the untold story of Australia's exotic invaders. But infect them it did. Victoria, for some reason, became the hotbed of all this. Despite the experience with rabbits, dozens of other foolish introductions were made. In the 1860s, the Ballarat Acclimatisation Society loosed foxes into the landscape and they quickly became a scourge, a position from which they have not yet retreated. Other animals escaped or were abandoned and went wild. Camels were used to build the railway from Adelaide to Alice Springs but were set free when the work was completed. Today, 100,000 of them roam the central and western deserts, the only place in the world where one hump dromedaries exist in the wild. Across the country there are up to 5 million wild donkeys, a million or more wild horses, called brumbies, and large numbers of water buffalo, cows, goats, sheep, pigs, foxes and dogs. Feral pigs have been caught in Melbourne suburbs. There are so many introduced species in fact that the red kangaroo, once the largest animal on the continent, is now only the 13th biggest. There's also this uh, guy, uh, Harold Holt, he was the Prime Minister and basically he went for a swim and drowned. And uh, this, this dude that Bryson met, he said, they built a memorial to him in Melbourne. Know what it was? I, indi I indicated that I had no idea. He grinned very slightly. A municipal swimming pool. Seriously? His grin broadened, but the nod was sincere. This is a terrific country, I said. Yeah, he agreed happily. It is, you know. All right, so my good camera is back and uh, we are good to finish reviewing this, I guess. I like this little conversation here. They're, um, Bryson's admiring the view with one of his, his tour guides. You know, if you put this in Virginia or Vermont, I mused, there would be scores of people here, even at this hour. There'd be souvenir stands and probably an IMAX screen and an adventure park. Hal nodded. It'd be the same in the Blue Mountains. It's like I've been telling you. This corner of Victoria is a great secret. Don't put it in your book. Certainly not, 
I replied sincerely. I think this is quite sad because obviously one of the great sort of travesties in the world is the way that Aborigines, uh, Aborigines were treated in uh, Australia. And uh, so Bryson's writing about it here. A few Europeans, what contention, James Cook notably, viewed the Aborigines sympathetically. In the Endeavour Journal, Cook wrote, They may appear to some to be the most wretched people on earth, but in reality they are far happier than we as Europeans. They live in a tranquillity which is not disturbed by the inequality of condition. The earth and the sea of their own accord furnish them with all things necessary for life. They seem to set no value upon anything we gave them, nor would they ever part with anything of their own. Elsewhere, he added with a touch of poignancy, all they seemed to want was for us to be gone. So it says here as well, such was the marginal such was the marginalization of the native peoples that until 1967 the federal government did not even include them in national censuses did not in other words count them as people so actually nobody necessarily knows how many aborigines there were we just know that it's dropped by a lot uh so uh, we've got here in taming the great south land william j lines details examples of the most appalling cruelty by settlers towards the natives of aborigines butchered for dog food of an aboriginal woman forced to watch her husband killed then made to wear his decapitated head around her neck of another chased up a tree and tormented from below with rifle shots. Every time a bullet hit, Lines reports, she pulled leaves off the tree and thrust them into her wounds, till at last she fell lifeless to the ground. What is perhaps most shocking is how casually so much of this was done, and at all levels of society. In an 1839 history of Tasmania, written by a visitor named Melville, the author relates how he went out one day with a respectable young gentleman to hunt kangaroos. As they rounded a bend, the young gentleman spied a form crouched and hiding behind a fallen tree. Stepping over to investigate and finding it only to be a native, the appalled Melville wrote, the gentleman lifted the muzzle to the native's breast and shot him dead on the spot. I thought this was quite sad. Uh, this is a story about a crocodile. Much of the rest of the museum was given over to cases of stuffed animals illustrating the Northern Territory's extraordinary biological diversity. Pride of place was given to an enormous stuffed crocodile named Sweetheart, who was for a time the most famous in Australia. Sweetheart, who was, despite the effeminate name, a male, had a passionate dislike for outboard engines and used to attack any boats that disturbed his peace. Unusually for a crocodile, he never harmed a person, but he crunched at least 15 boats and their motors, bringing a certain unexpected liveliness to many a fisherman's afternoon. In 1979, when it was feared that he would do himself some serious harm, he was constantly being clobbered by propellers, wildlife officials decided to move him somewhere safer. Unfortunately, the capture was botched when a cable snagged and Sweetheart drowned. So he was stuffed and put on display in the Darwin Museum, where he has been impressing visitors ever since with his very substantial heft. He stretches almost 17 feet and in life weighed over 1,700 pounds. So this is crazy as well. He goes to this place called Daily Waters. Daily Waters became a stop-off point between Brisbane and Darwin on the run to Singapore and on to London in the early days of Qantas and the old Imperial Airways. Lady Mountbatten was amongst the first overnight guests at the hotel. Goodness knows what she made of the place, though I dare say she was just awfully glad to be on solid ground. In the early days, a commercial flight from London involved, in addition to nerves of steel, 42 refuelling stops, up to five changes of aircraft and a train journey through Italy because Mussolini wouldn't allow flights through Italian airspace. It took 12 days. As well as the seasonal monsoons, the flights were subject to dust storms, mechanical failures, navigational confusion and occasional pot shots from hostile or impish Bedouins. Crashes were not infrequent. The perils of aviation in the period are neatly encapsulated in the experience of Harold C. Brinsmead, the head of Australia's Civil Aviation Department in the first days of commercial aviation. In 1931, Brinsmead was on a flight to London, partly for business and partly to demonstrate the safety and reliability of modern air passenger services, when his plane crashed on takeoff in Indonesia. No one was seriously hurt, but the plane was a write-off. Not wanting to wait for a replacement aircraft to be flown in, Brinsmead boarded a flight with a new Dutch airline KLM. That flight crashed while taking off in Bangkok. On this occasion, five people were killed and Brinsmead suffered serious injuries from which he never recovered. He died two years later. Meanwhile, the surviving passengers carried on to London in a replacement plane. That plane crashed on the return trip. One thing I thought was quite interesting, he was talking about people climbing um, Ayers Rock, which has recently been in the news that that's now been banned and like the last people to climb it recently climbed it, which is good. Preserve it, you know? Thought this was crazy as well so you don't have to be a genius to work out that aborigines are australia's greatest social failing for virtually every indicator of prosperity and well-being hospitalization rates suicide rates childhood mortality imprisonment employment you name it the figure for aborigines range from twice as bad to up to 20 times worse than for the general population according to john pilger australia is the only developed nation that ranks high for incidents of trachoma a viral disease that often leads to blindness 
and it is almost exclusively an Aboriginal malady. Overall, the life expectancy of the average Indigenous Australian is 20 years, 20 years less than that of the average white Australian. I thought this was very telling as well. At the end of the 20th century, an Aboriginal Australian was still 18 times more likely to die from an infectious disease than a white Australian, and 17 times more likely to be hospitalised as a result of violence. An Aboriginal baby remained two to four times more likely to die at birth, depending on cause. And I thought this was quite sad as well. It says, As I sat now on the Todd Street Mall with my coffee and watched the mixed crowds, happy white shoppers with Saturday smiles and a spring in their step, shadowy aborigines with their curious bandages and slow swaying knocked about gait, I realised that I didn't have the faintest idea what the solution to all this was, what was required to spread the fruits of general Australian prosperity to those who seemed so signally unable to find their way to it. If I were contracted by the Commonwealth of Australia to advise on Aboriginal issues, all I could write would be, do more, try harder, start now. So without an original or helpful thought in my head, I just sat for some minutes and watched these poor disconnected people shuffle past. Then I did what most white Australians do. I read my newspaper and drank my coffee and didn't see them anymore. It's kind of crazy, like he's aware of his own prejudice and his own, you know, fortune, I suppose, to be born not an Aborigine. Another thing that I thought was quite touching here that was quite sad as well. Perhaps it's my natural pessimism, but it seems that an awfully large part of travel these days is to see things while you still can. The most disturbing thought of all, I suppose, is that with so much still unrecorded, many plants could disappear before they're even found. The only other thing I wanted to mention here was that there was a mention of when some um, stock market trading, it got so intense that one guy lost an ear. How? I don't understand. <laughs> But yeah, as you can probably tell from the way I've reacted to it, I've enjoyed reading this. I gave it a pretty solid four out of five. It's an interesting little book to learn more about Australia. Good little travel book as well, but also it's humorous as well, you know? So full of facts, but full of humor and just a, you know, generally a pleasure. So yeah, enjoyed it. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Down Under by Bill Bryson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.